of the last two lectures, the class is not just very large, but there is really a wide diversity of experience in the students that come into this class, both in terms of their previous biology preparation, but also where they came from and what they've done in the past. It's really very difficult for me as an instructor to choose a level to pitch this lecture at that's going to be ideal for everybody. And so, for those of you for whom it is not ideal, for example, if the lecture is too slow, you've already had AP Biology and you've covered much of this material, my advice to you is to really take some of the concepts that we're talking about in class, go back, you already know the basic concept, go in and get some more information on it from the book, from the website, post questions and either we'll try to answer them or your fellow students will try to answer them. And that way you can enrich your understanding of these concepts and that will not only help you in this class, but will help you as you move forward. The other thing is that if there's somebody who has less preparation than you and they are looking for somebody to help them or explain a concept, that is, in my opinion, the best way to learn something, is to actually try and explain it to somebody else and you find the parts of that concept that you may know very well and it will reveal to you things that you may not know as well as you thought you did. So not only will the person that you're helping benefit, but you yourself will benefit probably even more than the person you're helping. Um, and I have to say that I have been teaching this class, this is my ninth year, and I've been in biology, I still told you in the first lecture, 37 years, and every year I do new things in this class. Much of what I learn from this class that's new is associated with preparing my materials for lecture each time and trying to think about them in the context of the changing world that we're in and new developments of biology, but also from the types of questions that you guys ask. Okay, for those of you who find it too fast, we do have the um, a lecture is being podcast, and you can access that from the website, and we cover the same material in A and B. And we are also getting this one videotaped, and the videos will be available starting today, and we will put up a link on the website. And so those are also another place where if you felt like, oh, I just missed something, what we don't encourage you to do is go back and sit through another 50-minute lecture. It's hard enough, I know, to stay awake for 50 minutes while you're here. 50 minutes doing nothing but listening to another lecture is not going to help you. But you may have missed something, so going to a particular place in the lecture, especially like with a podcast, you can go to slide 14, because I just didn't get that one, she went too fast, or, or was very confusing, which can be true as well. And, and then you can look at that material. Okay, we also have a number of options at UCI, like BioSide peer tutors. Do we have any peer tutors in the audience now? And if we do, can you please stand up and identify yourselves? Oh, say, <laughs> okay, down here. And that is a free uh, tutoring service, and you can access them here. BioSide peer tutors, as well as ORC tutors, have to have done extremely well in the class to get into the program, and they have insights about things that are confusing and how you might learn material that I can't provide to you because I'm giving you my best rendition. Getting another perspective is really helpful. So LARC tutoring is another tutoring program. Do we have any LARC tutors in here right now? I don't see any LARC tutors, but there is, there is LARC tutoring for this class. So again, these are links on the website. We also have a link to a study tips page on the course website that was developed with the help of some of my TAs a few years back, getting feedback from students about what helped them succeed in the class. And then we have research and clinical opportunity links on the course website as well. Okay, Monday's lecture, we started really up with our content and thinking about cells and membranes and the structure of membranes. And today we're going to focus on traffic across membranes. Because as most of you know, cell membranes are selectively permeable. That is, they're really good at actually letting some things go through and keeping other things out. And so we are going to talk about in this lecture, what are the mechanisms whereby things are going across the selectively permeable plasma membrane. There are three major passage strategies that we're going to talk about are traffic, 
which is direct passage through the lipid bilayer. And this is always passive, meaning that it does not require direct cellular energy. We have passage mediated by transport proteins. And this can either be passive, meaning it doesn't require cellular energy, or it can be active, and it does use cellular energy. And the third mechanism is vesicular transport, and this mechanism is always active. OK, so we're going to go over each of these three individually, and I'll give you examples of each. Direct passage through the lipid bilayer, as I said, is always passive, does not use cellular energy, at least directly. And we have substances that can then only move down their concentration gradients. And so things can move in and out of the cell by a passive direct passage through the lipid bilayer, but the direction they're moving is governed by the concentration gradient of that molecule that's moving. Characteristics of molecules that cross directly are, in general, small, uncharged molecules. So for example, gases, including CO2 and oxygen, are rel go relatively easily across the hydrophobic tail region of the lipid bilayer. Remember, that's where the phospholipid tails are. That's hydrophobic. And um, these are uncharged, so they're pretty good at going through hydrophobic regions. We also have small hydrocarbons. They get their name because it's a string of carbons with hydrogens. And these go also relatively easily through the lipid bilayer because these are uncharged molecules as well. So, and this actually looks kind of like the structure of the tail of the phospholipid, right? It's a long string of hydrocarbons. So, is this a saturated or an unsaturated hydrocarbon? It's saturated, that's right, because it only has single bonds between the carbons and there are hydrogens at other, every other possible point, so they're saturated. Unsaturated hydrocarbons would also go across the lipid bilayer easily because they're not charged. And they're, because they're unsaturated, they have a double bond here that gives them a kink in the molecular structure. But these still, because they're not charged, will go through that hydrophobic region of the lipid bilayer relatively straight, in a relatively straightforward and fast fashion. Okay. So we're going to be using our clickers a lot today. Um, here is the first content question. The rate of direct passage through a lipid bilayer is most rapid for which of these following molecules? And for all of these, you can talk to each other, and then we'll, I'll give you about a, you know, 30 seconds to a minute for each one. Which is passage that 
fibers transport proteins. And these in general are hydrophilic molecules that need transport proteins because they can't go directly across the hydrophobic region. So hydrophilic molecules are charged molecules, so we know they have either an extra uh, electron or they've lost an electron or maybe two, in fact, or more. And then we have polar molecules, and that means there's unequal dis charge distribution in the molecule such that one part of the molecule has a partial positive charge and the other part has a partial negative <coughs> charge. Those ones are a little bit more challenging to recognize, but when we get into our chemistry section in uh, lecture 7 through 9, I'll give you some uh, rules for how to do that. But if you see a plus or minus, you know it's charged. And with the, um, to figure out if something's polar or not, you actually have to look at the functional groups, and I'll be telling you how to do that in later lectures. For now, water is a polar molecule. Ions are charged. And glucose and sucrose are also examples of polar molecules. Okay. One of the interesting things here is that there are specific transport proteins for each substance. So, for example, in a liver cell that is transporting glucose from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, the transport protein that's involved in doing that does not transport fructose from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, even though fructose is the structural isomer of glucose. And so it's really specific. Every protein or macromolecule that's going to go across the cell, or and it doesn't actually it doesn't have to be a macromolecule, it could be water or ions, they will have their own specific proteins that allow them to go across the cell membrane. Okay, we can have passive transport that is mediated by proteins, and that is called facilitated diffusion. This is, these are two models showing how facilitated diffusion works. In one case here, we have the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell. It is depicted as basically just a pore. The, the protein makes a pore in the membrane so that the molecules can flow across the membrane, and these are molecules that would be hydrophilic, so they're going to fall, flow through this protected environment to the inside of the cell. So they don't have to pass directly through this lipid fiber. Okay, that's one uh, way facilitated diffusion proteins work. A second way are there's carrier proteins where pro the molecule that's traveling across binds to the carrier protein. And again, still in the absence of any outside of cellular energy, we have this change in conformation of this protein that then allows this molecule that was outside to be deposited on the inside of the cell. So this is passive if it doesn't use, directly use cellular energy. And so in these conditions, molecules can only flow down their concentration gradient. So in both of these examples, we have molecules flowing from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. But in fact, that wouldn't have to be true, right? In this channel, how would we get these yellow balls to flow from the inside to the outside? Yeah, we just put a lot more of these yellow balls on the inside compared to the outside, and their concentration gradient would tend to, they would flow down their concentration gradient out of the cell. Okay, water crossing the membrane is a classic example of facilitated diffusion. And that's uh, maybe why some of you who picked water in the last example was you knew that water went across the cell membrane, but you might not have known how it goes or what's mediating that. So water is polar, and I have a mistake in the notes, I think I said charge. So it's polar, it has a partial positive and partial negative charge. And so the predicted rate of direct passage is very slow, but we know the actual rate of movement in and out of cells is relatively fast. And in fact, back in the 1970s, when I was a student in a classroom, we knew water flew, flowed across the uh, cell membrane quite rapidly, but we had no idea how that happened. It wasn't until 1992 when Peter Avery and colleagues um, identified the first aquaporin protein, as its name suggests, suggest water pore, that aquaporin proteins are channels 
that regulate water flow across the membrane in both animal and plant cells. And there's a bunch of different types of aquaporin channels, but all of them regulate water flow. Okay, and so how does that work? We have our extracellular solution here, intracellular here, this is our membrane of our cell. It actually um, is it's facilitated diffusion and it acts as a channel, not as a carrier. So basically, these guys go from the outside to the inside. So here, our little yellow ball is water, in this case. OK, and it can go from the inside to the outside, depending on the concentration gradient of water. So when I first saw things like this, and was thinking about it in my head, I was thinking about it, you know, sort of a, a pore in a membrane, and you take uh, a jug of water, and you pour it, and it goes down into the cell. But that's not really how it works. And that was sort of illustrated to me when I first saw this little video uh, that was up on the website that was associated with the Nobel Prize that Peter Avery's group won in 2003 for discovering the aquaporin channel. So this is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. And this is the aquaporin channel. Each of these depicts the two reds and a uh, white. That's a water molecule. And you're going, when I get this video to go, you'll be watching water molecules flow through here. And they've colored one yellow, so you can see its pro progress through. And it doesn't just pour through. It's kind of like a fight for these guys to get through, because it's very tight passage, basically. So this is the type of molecular motion that you would see in this water molecule transiting this region. And because it's going in this direction, we must know that right, we have water flow going from here to here. So we know the solute concentrations relative on the outside versus the inside. OK. And I want to actually go over this principle with you, starting with this problem. We have three identical animal cells that are put in solution shown below. In which does water flow out of the cell? This cell is put in a hypertonic solution, this cell in an isotonic solution, and this cell in a hypotonic solution. So I'll give you 30 seconds to answer this one. I put it down here, I get about three, and in my cell I only have one. 
So my solute concentration outside is higher than inside. So which direction does the mine water want to flow? Out of the cell, because we want to equalize the solute concentration on either side and the water concentration. So here, we have higher solute concentration. So if water flows in this direction, it should be rooted out. Okay, hypotonic to the cell, we have a lower concentration of solute in the solution versus the cell. So here, we have our cell, it has four solute molecules in it. We draw a circle of equal volume anywhere else in this solution, and we will find a lower concentration of solutes, right? And so in this case, water is going to want to flow into the cell, so there's uh, you can think of it in terms of the concentration of solute or water. So here, we want water to flow in, uh, um, into the cell, and that's going to dilute this concentration of solutes. Okay, and isotonic is the same concentration of solute in the solution and the cell. And so here, we have water flow that flows back and forth, and there's no net flow in either direction. Even if you got the first question right, it would um, oftentimes help to get some additional practice. So there's a practice section, uh, question six on page 141 of your book that I would recommend you looking at. And there are answers in the back of the book, so it would help to test yourself on these. But to follow up on this, I want to give you some additional help because osmosis, this property that we're talking about, is not just important every day in the lab, as I've just shown you if you're working with cells, you really have to know what the solute concentration of the cells are. It's important every day in our bodies. So here's a question. In pregnancy, blood volume increases and can result in decreased solute concentration in the blood. This would result in which of the following? Swelling of tissues or movement of water out of the cell? Sometimes drawing a little picture helps. And that's why I put these things in, the, in your notes, so you have a, um, a, a place. I'm going to close the window now.
associated with active transport in animal cells are sodium potassium pumps. These are called electrogenic pumps, and the reason they're called that is because they move charged ions across the membrane. So they maintain a high intracellular potassium and low sodium concentration. So they're moving these two charged ions across the membrane. And because they're charged, they generate a voltage across the membrane. That's why it's called electrogenic. So this diagram goes through the actual conformational changes in the sodium potassium pump that are involved in this exchange of sodium and potassium. So I'm going to walk through it with you. Here we start with the protein open to the inside of the cell. In this conformation, it combines three sodium ions. When it does, this stimulates phosphorylation of the protein by ATP, so that's a form of cellular energy. We'll talk later in the class about how exactly this works. But when it's in the presence of ATP, we get phosphorylation, and that causes a conformational change in the protein, so that now it's not open to the inside, so it was open to the inside like this, and now it changes conformation and opens to the outside. As it opens to the outside, the sodium ions diffuse away, and potassium ions bind. As the potassium ions bind, this causes dephosphorylation, so this phosphate group gets kicked off. The protein changes conformation again, so now it's again open to the inside of the cell. The potassium ions are dumped out into the intracellular solution, and it's ready to start again. So this is one cycle of the sodium-potassium pump. So I'm going to give you a problem, and starting conditions are you have five sodium ions and potassium ions outside the cell, and five sodium and potassium ions inside the cell. We're going to run this pump twice, and then I want you to tell me if the inside of the cell is going to be negative with respect to the outside, or positive with respect to the outside. Okay. Discuss. Okay, click in. Uh, 
uh, channels or carriers, but in both cases, they have to go down their concentration gradient because we're not putting in additional cellular energy. Active transport, on the other hand, still uses a, does use a protein, but it, in the presence of ATP or other forms of cellular energy, it can pump things up and we can move molecules across the membrane up their concentration gradient. Okay, now we need to talk about co-transport, where active transport is coupled to passive transport. So in this example, I have a proton pump. It's sitting in the membrane right here. This is the intracellular side of the cell. And a proton pump is we're sort of like a sort of potassium pump in that it needs ATP and it changes conformation. And when it changes conformation, it pumps positively charged hydrogen ions from the inside of the cell to the outside. Because it's positively charged, when we do that, we build up a positive charge here outside and a negative charge here. So it's also called an electrogenic pump and it maintains a hydrogen ion gradient and creates this voltage across the membrane. When we take a, a proton pump like this and put it in a membrane with a sucrose hydrogen ion co-transporter, then we can move sucrose across the membrane up its concentration gradient without actually having direct cellular energy use by this transporter. How that works is we have our proton pump that is pumping out hydrogen ions. It's creating this hydrogen ion gradient, and then the hydrogen ions can bind to this site on the sucrose hydrogen ion co-transporter. When it does, if there is a sucrose molecule around as well, when this goes down its concentration gradient, right, this is just flows through this down its concentration gradient, there's a movement and a change in the shape of this protein. If a sucrose is also bound here, it gets moved into the inside of the cell as well. So what happened is this concentration gradient of hydrogen that was built up by the pump is now used by this co-transporter where hydrogen ions flow down their concentration gradient and they drag sucrose along down in, um, up their concentration gradient. So there would be more sucrose in here than outside. So that would be, generally, that wouldn't happen. It only happens because it's coupled to the movement of hydrogen ions down their concentration. Okay, and our last form of passage across the membrane is passage mediated by vesicular transport. This is important for moving large molecules in general, proteins and carbohydrates, and it's active, meaning it requires cellular energy. And this is a, a, often a source of confusion because in your book and in the slides that I'm showing, I don't show all the various steps that are involved in this type of transport, and you don't see exactly where the cellular energy is used. But there are a whole bunch of intermediate steps and proteins that are involved in also all of the types of uh, transport, pass, uh, uh, transport that I'll talk about that's associated with vesicular transport. And so this is, you just have to remember that this is um, active, it requires energy, and when you are taking Cell Biology 103, you will actually be looking at many of the actual um, intermediates that are important for mediating these processes, and you'll see where cellular energy comes into it. Okay, so for now, you need to know that there are two basic mechanisms. We have endocytosis, where vesicles formed from the plasma membrane bring outside molecules into the cell. And we have exocytosis, where we have internal membrane vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane, so they're made inside the cell, and then they move up to the plasma membrane where they fuse and they release molecules to the outside or they put proteins into the plasma membrane. So I have a little video or a little um, animation that comes from your book. <coughs> Endocytosis is the movement of materials into a cell via membranous vesicles. Exocytosis is the movement of materials out of the cell via membranous vesicles. These processes allow patches of membrane to flow from compartment to compartment, reminding us that a cell is a dynamic. Right, and we, the 
concept of membrane fluidity, as you can probably imagine, is very important for this process of endocytosis and exocytosis because the fluidity of the membrane will affect how well these membranes uh, fuse with each other and form vesicles. Okay, and I have a, uh, a very short demo today uh, for exocytosis, which is called my stretchy ball vesicle. And this was inspired by my daughter, who is just graduated from college. But four years ago, she was in my living room one day about this time of the year and came home from high school and said, oh, mom, I've got my Halloween costume. She showed me this, and then she did this. She said, see, I'm going to be, and I can't remember what it was, some, some creature. And I said, oh, my god, Riley. That looks like a membrane vesicle. And so, you know, and of course she says, um, um, but in fact, that this, what, what it really reminded me of a membrane vesicle was because the important feature of these membrane vesicles is that they, when we do exocytosis, a, me, a vesicle is inside a cell and it comes up to a membrane and it fuses with the membrane. What was inside the vesicle is now on the outside of the cell. Endocytosis is this formation of a vesicle from the membrane that comes back into the cell. So what was ever on the outside of the cell is now on the inside of the vesicle. And that's a really important point to know because we're going to be trafficking things around the cell in a lot of cases, and you're going to need to know what's inside the vesicle and how it gets to the outside of the cell. Okay, and that's actually not only what's inside the vesicle, um, on the surface of the vesicle, but you can have things that are inside the vesicle, packaged inside the vesicle, and then when you open it up like this, not only do you put this on the outside, but you can release things into the outside environment as well. And you're going to see that's very important for cell communication. Okay, so we have three types of endocytosis. The first is called phagocytosis, often termed cellular eating. And the important feature here is that here we have extension of pseudopodia from the cell membrane. So here's the cell membrane. Pseudopodia extend. They fuse at the end. And when they fuse, then whatever was outside the cell is now inside the cell. And so we've seen the phagocytosis, right? When we did our white blood cell movie, so here's our white blood cell. It's extending pseudopodia, and it's going to go capture this bacteria that we saw that was uh, moving away from it in the cell chase movie. Okay, quite different than that is pinocytosis, which is also often referred to as cellular drinking. And so this is where there is a mem the cell membrane is pinching off little bits of membrane, forming a vesicle, and that vesicle will contain what was ever, whatever was outside the cell comes into the cell in this vesicle. It's quite nonspecific. It just takes out whatever was outside the cell and brings it in. And finally, we have receptor-mediated endocytosis. <coughs> this is an active process where there is binding of a specific molecule to a specific receptor that is associated with stimulating the formation of this vesicle or this endocytosis process. It doesn't happen until a specific ligand binds to a specific receptor and causes the formation of this vesicle. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of receptor-mediated endocytosis, and that is the uptake of cholesterol in human cells. So human cells need cholesterol. Um, we know that it's in the membrane, right? It's an important component. And cholesterol travels in the blood in low-density lipoprotein complexes. These will bind to LDL receptors on the cell surface, um, uh, or it's on cell membranes, and these regions are called coded pits. So this is a coded pit. These are specific receptors here, and when these are LDL receptors in my rendition here, when LDL, these purple triangles bind to it, it causes stimulation of formation of this vesicle, and it brings in the LDL into the cell, and now it's inside the vesicle, inside the cell. 
This is a way to concentrate substances that are kind of at low concentration outside the cell. The cell doesn't have to constantly do endocytosis to get things into the cell, right? It waits until the molecule that has a binding site to the receptor, and then that stimulates endocytosis. Okay, so what if LDL receptors are defective? Would you see cholesterol accumulate in the cell, in the cholesterol levels in the blood go up, or cholesterol levels in the blood go down? Okay, click in if you haven't. Okay, very good. Seventy-three percent of you are correct that cholesterol levels in the blood go up. And in fact, in familial hypercholesterolemia, this is exactly what happens. It's a genetic disease that involves defective LDL receptors. In this case, there's then a buildup of lipids in the blood vessels because they aren't properly taken into the cells. This can impede blood flow and can lead to early onset of atherosclerosis. So this is one type of receptor-mediated endocytosis. There are plenty of other pairings of ligands and receptors that get into the cell by the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis. So you have to know this process but you don't have to memorize all the receptors, I'll tell you about those, if you ever need to know them. Okay, finally, for your final problem, we have, in starvation, blood albumin levels drop. This would result in a shrinking of tissues or the movement of water into the cells. Okay, click it if you haven't. Yeah, 